Is this the first in the in the new no, year? No, we've had it's the first in the new year, but we've had what now? Is this this will be number four, right, Matt? This is number four. We're trying to get a, a lecture from each continent every hey. month. So oh, that's we've great. so we've done where have we done? We've done South America. We South Africa. South Af well Af yeah, yeah, South Africa. And we have done Oceania. Very nice. And so, yeah, you are covering Northern America. You're representing all of North America. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should have maybe thought a little bit bigger in terms of my talk. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's um, it's the, the point of Global Pass is to just get the snapshots from around the world and all these, all this wonderful research that's going on. That's so. great, though, that you're getting such kind of like regional representation we've been um yeah we've been really fortunate with speakers agreeing yourself included um just to covering you know some big topics but um yeah just showing different ways of the way the ways the past is explored across the world and how it manifests so yeah cool so, do you have who do you have lined up after me uh we have uh professor uh li yang who is from Zhengzhou University in China, who's going to be talking about um, silk routes in oh, cool. in and out of uh, Bronze Age China. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to be and something different again. And the last talk was on seafaring in the Pacific. So, wow, the, yeah, <laughs> it does it is it does do a good job of showing how different yeah uh, people people think. I will be talking about um, stone tools. Not really that flashy, but oh. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it'll uh, it will show us the diversity, the range. Yeah, looking forward to it. The stone tools are the longest, you know, the longest used tools. So we're still using. We're yeah, still exactly. talking about them. They were used for a long time. <laughs> All right, should we get going? I think. Yeah. Yep. You're happy for me to kick off then, Matt? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna mute and. Tag. All right, so welcome everybody to our fourth Global Pasts uh, lecture. Um, this evening we are very lucky to have Lindsay Montgomery here with us. Before we begin, as with all events that we run, uh, this is a zero tolerance uh, space for any form of abuse and you will be kicked out if that is what happens. If you see any problems in the chat or anything along those lines, then please drop me a message and I will work to sort that out if I haven't already seen it. Um, there is no space for um, <clears throat> abuse or harassment in these kinds of events. Leaving that aside, on to the happier topic. We're recording tonight's uh, lecture and it will be up on our YouTube channel. And it is my huge pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lindsay Montgomery. Lindsay studied for a BA in Anthropology and Human Rights at Barnard College at Columbia University and gained her PhD from Stanford studying the nomadic archeology span of Northern New Mexico. She's an assistant professor at the University of Arizona and between 2019 and 2020, she had a Radcliffe Fellowship at Harvard. She's an anthropological archeologist whose work focuses on creating the complex counter histories that talk about indigenous resistance, persistence and survivance. Her work is multidisciplinary. She brings together archaeology, archives, oral histories and indigenous philosophy, as well as ethnographic sources. Her new book published with Routledge is titled A History of Mobility in New Mexico, Mobile Landscapes and Persistent Places. It has one of the most stunningly beautiful book covers I've seen in recent years. And if that isn't a reason enough for you to go and look it up right now, I don't know what is. I have been really lucky to get to know Lindsay through working on a book project with her, and I have learned a huge amount from her. So I'm really thrilled to be able to share uh, Lindsay's amazing knowledge with all of you tonight, and I'm sure that you too will learn a huge amount. Her talk this evening is titled An Alternative to Agriculture, Mobility and Persistence in Northern New Mexico. And with that, I will hand over to Lindsay and turn my camera off.
All right, thank you for that warm introduction. Hi, everyone. I know you're out there, even though I can't really see you on Zoom. Um, thanks to Rachel and Matt for the invitation to be part of this lecture series. And thanks to all of you guys for tuning in on a Monday evening. So I'm broadcasting to you from the traditional homelands and unceded territories of the Pasquayaki and Tono Atom people who have stewarded the lands here in Arizona since time immemorial. Today, I'm going to actually shift our focus not to Arizona, but to New Mexico and talk a little bit about the kind of key findings uh, from my new book that Rachel mentioned, A History of Mobility in New Mexico. And in talking through these kind of new developments, I really hope to demonstrate the diverse and continuous ways that indigenous peoples have engaged with the Northern Rio Grande landscape over time. So to accomplish this goal, I'm going to turn to the Taos Plateau. So the Taos Plateau is this expansive landscape that's etched with trails, rivers, arroyos, and one-track roads. These kind of smooth spaces and open grasslands are disrupted by the cavernous Rio Grande Gorge, which was formed 20 million years ago and is depicted behind me here. This area was used by indigenous people as important resource nodes for thousands of years, especially places like San Antonio Mountain, Cerro de la Ola, and Ute Mountains, which tower thousands of feet above the plateau's open grasslands. So while indigenous people have lived on these lands since time immemorial, archeological evidence for an indigenous presence on the plateau dates to roughly 5,500 BC and continues into the present. To date, a great deal of archeological research on indigenous history in Northern New Mexico has focused on the timing, context, and nature of maize agriculture. The development of agriculture has typically been seen as one of kind of two definitive and radical moments in the history of the region. The second one of these moments being the arrival of Spanish colonizers in the late 16th century. Archaeological and climactic evidence indicates that formal agriculture began in the northern Rio Grande around 1000 BCE, which is about the same time that we see agriculture developing elsewhere in the southwest. Most of these kind of theories of why agriculture develops at when it did is because of changes in the climate where we see a kind of increase in moisture rates, which made lowland cultivation ecologically possible. So while residential mobility declines after around 1000 BC, there is a notable continuation of mobility and hunting and gathering practices by both ancestral Puebloan peoples and equestrian nomads well into the colonial period. Southwestern archaeologists have often framed the transition from a primarily kind of hunting and gathering subsistence system to mixed farming and foraging economies in terms of a competition for territory and resources. This is, this is something that we see across archaeological theories that archaeologists love to talk about competition for resources. So as the story goes, as more indigenous people entered the region through migration, they began to gather into these larger aggregated villages, which challenged foraging communities for access to desirable land, eventually compelling residentially mobile groups to either intermarry with agriculturalists or to move north and east onto the plains or into the Great Basin, where hunting and gathering communities persisted. So the question is, if the agriculturalists were actually out competing hunter-gatherers, why do we see evidence from mobile lifeways persisting in the Rio Grande despite increasing competition for resources? Archaeologists Maxine McBrain and Bradley Vieira have referred to this kind of continuation of hunting and gathering in the northern southwest as resistant foraging. The term resistant foragers assumes that the adoption of agriculture was inevitable, 
basically what indigenous people were resisting was the pull towards sedentism and cultivation. So by placing indigenous people into these kind of bounded socioeconomic categories, forager versus agriculturalist, current archeological models describing the emergence of large scale agriculture actually gloss over the ways in which indigenous communities undertook subsistence practices that blurred these sorts of categories. So Pueblo people who engaged in forms of sedentary agriculture continued to engage in logistical and residential mobility throughout the region, and nomadic hunter-gatherers continued to occupy and use the northern Rio Grande landscape for varying lengths of time. The archaeological record of the Taos Plateau presents an opportunity to develop a kind of alternative model for writing about the relationship between place, subsistence, and mobility. This model attempts to step away from these kind of long-standing interests that archaeologists have had in documenting what we call the Neolithic Revolution, and instead focuses on how particular features of the local landscape structured and were structured by indigenous subsistence choices. This emphasis on kind of continuous mobility actually reflects the nature of the archeological record on the Taos Plateau, which is largely made up of these kind of low intensity sites, which have often been considered undiagnostic. When diagnostic materials are present at a lot of these kind of uh, stone tool scatters, they map onto lengthy time periods, stretching hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. Quite simply, the overall impression that one gets from the material record of the plateau is of continuity, not radical change. So rather than documenting domestication and population aggregation, I use the material record to discuss human connections to specific places and their movements between these places. Specifically, I've conducted survey work at three playa sites on the plateau, which I've called Puncha Lake, Arroyo Punche, and three basins. So playas are basically a widespread phenomena across the Great Basin in Southwest, and they're these kind of dried lake beds that seasonally fill with water. I've also conducted survey at two mountain sites in, on the Taos Plateau, Cerro de la Ola on the west side, and Ute Mountain on the east side of the gorge. And I'll talk a little bit about the archeological record at these uh, five sites throughout today's talk. So these landscape features resemble what archeologist Sarah Schlanger has called persistent places. So the sustained use of specific places on the plateau is a result of their unique ecological characteristics. For example, Access to, let's see here, access to easily, access, easily exploitable plants or game resources or workable stone for tool production. Places become persistent because they were previously used or occupied. Their importance passed down to successive generations who orally shared knowledge. In addition to kind of physically revisiting sites, indigenous people return to these persistent places through stories, songs, and prayers. These physical and metaphysical acts of revisitation suggest that indigenous engagements with the Taos landscape don't fit within traditional archeological models of intensive occupation. Instead, they're better understood through the kind of lens of visitation visits which could vary in duration and frequency over time in response to changing ecological, economic, and social conditions. So the persistent places of the Taos Plateau are connected through trails and pathways which have been used and expanded upon for over 10,000 years. The movement between places on the plateau was not just functional. As suggested in the quote shown here by explorer John Wesley Powell, movement along the trail was considered sacred by mobile groups like the youth who believe in a kind of reciprocal connection between the physical and the spiritual worlds. So what emerges from this kind of indigenizing approach to the deep past 
are a series of place-based histories that document the life ways of indigenous societies engaged in a wide range of what we call residential as well as logistical mobility. How human communities use playas and mountains changed over time in response to the different needs and ideologies of the people who inhabited them. While things certainly change, the archaeological record for these playas and freestanding mountains also provide evidence for remarkable continuities. Over thousands of years, these places have remained important resource nodes and activity centers for indigenous people. So as I'll talk about today, this kind of persistence reflects a variety of factors like the ecology and topography of each location, as well as the geospatial position of these places in relationship to strategic crossing points uh, across the gorge and natural resources. So in addition to focusing on place and movement across the landscape, I advocate for the incorporation of indigenous oral histories and worldviews into the interpretation of the material record of the plateau. So rather than imposing Western interpretive schema onto the North American past, this approach really takes seriously how indigenous people approach their history. Indigenous understandings of history are distinct from those traditionally drawn on by archaeologists. So Western forms of history typically produce kind of chronological narratives of important events based on linear understandings of time. Rather than linear time marked by calendrical dates, many indigenous communities think about time as cyclical. For example, the Hopi conceptualize their history as a cycle of worlds that existed in the past, present, and future. Each of these four worlds align with a catastrophic environmental event, places on the landscape and oral narratives, which explain the community's origins, migrations, social practices, and their current cultural values. So in addition to drawing on cyclical notions of time, most indigenous people hold a place-based understanding of history in which landscape features like the ones I've recorded on the plateau serve as kind of reservoirs of collective memory. These places and associated narratives constitute a community's cosmogeography. So Sunday Isol talks about cosmogeographies as a systems of territorial organization in which space is structured around astronomical and geographical markers that orient individuals within supernatural and physical worlds. The cosmogeographies of indigenous people are comprised of things like origin stories, but also things like migration narratives, place names, and place lore. These cosmogeographies link natural resources to a larger body of stories about communal origins and events. For example, the Hickory Apache believe that micaceous clay sources are inhabited by spirits, which are personifications of objects and natural forces. Oral histories provide detailed accounts of how these clay spirits taught Ende women how to make micaceous pottery, creating a kind of historical framework for contemporary practices among Hickory community members, like those shown here firing micaceous clay pots. Place-based histories also document the relationships between different indigenous communities. Take, for example, Apache Springs. Fed by Taos Blue Lake, Apache Springs flows south into the Rio Pueblo, depicted here, which eventually ends in a large buffalo pasture historically used by the Hickoria as a campsite. According to stories shared by Hickoria tribal member Gilbert Velarde, the spring is a place where Hickoria traders and families would stop during their annual journey to Taos Pueblo for the San Geronimo feast days in September. Although archaeologically unmarked, this pasture and its associated spring embodies the kind of long-standing economic and social relationships between Taos and the Hickory Apache. Personal narratives and teachings linked to place also help create a shared sense of history grounded in the land. For indigenous people engaging in highly mobile bison hunting lifestyles, personal narratives typically reference events and places linked to hunting journeys. 
Arrow's fall on the hunt is one of these narratives and was told to anthropologist Pliny Goodard in 1911 by a Hickorya man named Casa Maria. So the, the story Arrow falls on the hunt goes something like this. At, at some unknown time, time is barely referenced in, in Hickorya and indigenous stories in general, there was a group of Hickorya men camped along the Canadian River in preparation for a bison hunt. The hunting party traveled east towards the plains in search of bison, first stopping at Laughlin Peak, a prominent landmark that's visible while traveling east from the Cimarron along the Canadian River. The party then proceeded east, stopping at Saddle Washed Away and Balasoye. After two days of preparations at Balasoye, the hunting party moved one last time to a place called Gadari and camped below in an arroyo. Over the course of three days, the party conducted a successful hunt, killing many bison and leaving the ground littered with arrows, hence the name of the story. So by documenting this relationship between points across a, an expansive landscape, Casa Maria's story creates a sort of memory web connecting personal experiences to a broader set of shared spaces and narratives. Indigenous approaches to place differ in fundamental ways from non-Indigenous ones. For European nation states, the land is an inanimate space that can be organized into these kind of bounded, controllable geographical units. Archaeological mapping projects have typically perpetuated this kind of colonial habit of reordering and dividing up indigenous landscapes into these kind of gridded spatial units. The creation of archaeological site maps divides out the land into these culturally modified and natural areas, which simply don't represent how indigenous people think about the land or their histories on that land. This kind of method that archeologists use ends up excluding large swaths of the landscape used but not materially marked by mobile indigenous groups. As noted by Chip Colwell and TJ Ferguson, this kind of piecemeal approach to mapping has very real repercussions for indigenous people seeking to make legal claims to traditional territories and natural resources by using the archaeological record. The high stakes of archaeological research in North America compels us to incorporate indigenous understandings of place-based histories into our interpretations of the contemporary, but also, I would argue, into the deep past. So in this talk, I focus on landscapes and places rather than chronology and grids. Let's start uh, by looking at some archeological evidence from Playa sites on the Taos Plateau. So broken and isolated projectile points like the ones shown here are clustered around the rims of Playa sites on, across the west side of the Taos Plateau. And they indicate that indigenous communities were using these sites for roughly 4,000 years and they were using them primarily as hunting sites, specifically intercept hunting sites where an animal would come to the playa to get water and the indigenous hunters would uh, intercept the, the game on the way to the water source. So from roughly 5,500 to about 1800 BC, these kind of dry playa lakes were used as hunting sites by indigenous groups engaged in a large scale north-south residential mobility round that would involve movement over hundreds of kilometers. During this period, this particular period, the climate was uh, increasingly arid, making mobility to strategic uh, resource patches a key part of indigenous subsistence. That, each of these kind of playa sites that I've looked at on the Taos Plateau were being used really similarly by archaic indigenous groups reflects their strategic location, both as a source of water within an increasingly arid time, but also as, as kind of strategic places within natural migration corridors for medium-sized game, specifically elk. 
While playas appear to have consistently been used as kind of hunting sites by residentially mobile indigenous people throughout the region, mountain slopes on both sides of the gorge are more frequently associated with a kind of localized mobility circuit associated with logistical activities rather than residential mobility. So the archeological record at Cerro de la Ola on the west side of the gorge is comprised almost exclusively of concentrated lithic scatters containing diagnostic tools which date between 3200 BC and about 400 CE. These scatters along with the absence of residential structures indicate that mountain slopes were primarily used for these kind of short-term logistical activities associated with upland resource procurement, particularly things like pinion nuts, which were a really high source of protein and an alternative source to uh, wild game. The archeological record at Ute Mountain indicates that mountains on the east side of the Rio Grande Gorge were also used largely for logistical activities rather than as kind of residential base camps. The majority of projectile points identified at Ute Mountain were too fragmentary to actually stylistically date but those points that were identifiable primarily dated to between 3200 BC and 400 CE. So that's the same time period that we see occupation and use of Cerro de la Ola. So many of the points identified at U Mountain had broken tips, which is a indicator of breakage during hunting. The chipped stone assemblages documented at both of these mountains, at Cerro de la Ola and at Ute Mountain, suggests that these kind of mountainous areas on the plateau were important logistical activity sites for indigenous people in the region during a period where we actually see residential mobility circuits decrease in size from these kind of large scale north-south mobility circuits and into much more localized kind of east-west mobility circuits concentrated in the Rio Grande Valley itself. Evidence for large quantities of a uh, stone tool material called dacite at all of the sites that I looked at on the plateau indicate that this uh, that the acquisition of dacite was actually a kind of key shaper of indigenous mobility practices uh, during this long archaic period that period from 5500 BC to about 400 CE. So dacite makes up 90% 90%, it's crazy, of each assemblage I documented, while obsidian and particularly chert made up really small percentages. So the long-term and widespread use of dacite by indigenous people moving across the plateau over time is really striking, given the pronounced changes which are occurring over the archaic period in terms of the types of mobility that people are engaged in. This kind of longstanding use of dacite really suggests that proximity to this raw material source was a primary reason why Playa and mountain sites on the west side of the gorge near San Antonio Mountain became persistent places. So San Antonio Mountain, which is I showed here, is one of the primary sources of dacite on the Taos Plateau. There's another source at a place called Newman's Dome uh, but San Antonio's is the dominant source. So overall, the archeological record at Playa and mountain sites on the plateau suggests that indigenous people were moving in kind of east-west ways across the Rio Grande in order to access local raw materials for stone tool production. So within this kind of movement system, playas and upland forest areas would have been strategic stopping places at which you would hunt wild game and gather other forms of plant resources. So there's some interesting new data that has emerged to indicate that San Antonio Mountain might not be the only source of day site. So preliminary geochemical sourcing data suggests that indigenous people actually may not have been carrying day site across the gorge, but instead using locally available sources of day site on either side of the Rio Grande Gorge. 
So what I did was to take a small sample of tools from Ute Mountain and to use geochemical sourcing to identify where they were originally derived from. And what that data showed was that most of the tools found at Ute Mountain were actually geochemically sourced to a new variety of day site coming from Ute Mountain itself rather than from San Antonio or Newman Dome. So this is really interesting in comparison to what we see on the west side of the gorge, where we see all of the tools, all of the day site tools from the west side sourcing to Newman Dome or San Antonio Mountain. So because these kind of um, sources of day site were, were being used locally, what we see is that indigenous people weren't actually taking tools with them, and they also weren't reusing tools. So we see indigenous people basically discarding tools at high levels after they use them because they can go and get new sources of day site really easily. So of course we're going to need more evidence, geochemical sampling evidence from Ute Mountain to really solidly prove that it is a unique and differentiated day site source from San Antonio Mountain. But this kind of initial data really adds a kind of interesting uh, new dimension to how we're thinking about indigenous resource use on the plateau. So while the large quantities of day site chipstone at sites on the plateau demonstrate an intensive use of local resources, there's also some evidence for continued long distance travel and trade in the region. So obsidian objects from Cerro de la Ola, Ute Mountain and Puncha Lake all ge geochemically sourced to locations along the Chama River and the Jemez Mountains, both of which are located over 50 kilometers from the plateau. There's notable evidence of obsidian, there's a kind of notable absence of obsidian cores um, and also large numbers of flakes uh, at the sites on the plateau, which really suggests that these kind of non-local materials were entering the region as finished tools and then being retouched and reused on site. So this is a type of tool use pattern that indicates that indigenous people moving through the plateau were still engaging in some forms of this large scale mobility, despite at uh, increasingly uh, lower frequencies over time. As the most imposing feature of the Rio Grande landscape, the gorge itself played a role in shaping land use practices on the Taos Plateau. So unlike other locations in New Mexico, there's a real notable lack of evidence for uh, the use of the gorge for long-term base camps. So we don't have storage features, you don't see intensive domestic processing, you don't see on-site tool use or anything uh, that we might associate it with residential camps. In general, sites within the gorge are these kind of ephemeral single-use areas. So this pattern really contrasts with large scatters, which are identified on the rim of the gorge, which suggests that the gorge itself was kind of being used as a natural travel corridor rather than an intensive base camp area. So material evidence for revisitation along the rim of the gorge is spatially patterned with most large lithic scatters actually located on the east side rather than the west side of the gorge. Indeed, the archeological record of Ute Mountain is one of these kind of large revisited sites, which is full of what I call a lithic carpet, which is indicative of kind of continuous on-site tool production and use over time. The fact that these kind of large scatters tend to cluster actually along the east side of the gorge rim suggests that this side of the plateau was more consistently and intensively used by indigenous activity groups over time than the western side. So the densest concentration of archaic sites within the gorge itself is located at the confluence of the Rio Grande and Red River. The two largest scatters in this area contain thousands of pieces. And the density of these scatters likely reflects the fact that its location is at an easy crossing point between the east and west sides of the plateau. So this would have been a place where people could have actually crossed the gorge, which is largely impassable in most places. The Red River Rio Grande confluence is also associated with several natural springs, 
commonly referred to as big and little arsenic springs. So these natural springs are considered by indigenous people to be particularly powerful places, a belief which likely informed indigenous decisions to visit this area time and time again. The importance of springs within indigenous cosmogeographies is recorded within oral narratives that center these bodies of water. So according to stories told by people at Taos Pueblo, at the end of the world, a deity would make the hot springs boil over and flood the earth. Taos stories also indicate that hot springs like Ponce de Leon, which is shown here, as well as the small spring referred to as Sipapu, were places where their ancestors actually emerged into the region. Hot springs are also significant for mobile indigenous groups. So for example, according to one Apache narrative, a monster named He Kicks Them in the Water lived in a hot spring and would terrorize travelers by kicking them into the water and feeding them to his four daughters. And it was not until the culture hero, Killer of Enemies, killed him that this kind of terrorizing at the hot spring stopped. So we can't really, we can only really speculate as to why early indigenous groups moving through the gorge may have been stopping at the Red River Rio Grande confluence, but it, it is clear that these kind of large scatters represent a persistent place which was reused multiple times by indigenous people moving through the region. So the surface assemblages that are currently identified in the gorge suggest that this landscape feature was not intensively used as a residential camping location by indigenous people. But rock art evidence documented in the gorge does suggest that indigenous people were using this area to record hunting and gathering activities during this archaic period. So there's currently 25 sites in the Northern Rio Grande region that have petroglyphs that date between 5,500 BC and 900 CE. These glyphs depict abstract geometric images, including concentric circles, dots, wavy zigzag lines, as well as things like footprints, animal tracks, and quadrupeds like deer. The placement of many of these abstract images, particularly these kind of wavy lines, near hot springs and confluences within the gorge suggests that these images may have been used to actually mark or tap into the power located within these springs. While particular places within the gorge appear to have continued to serve as kind of important locations for image production, the types of images being produced by indigenous people changes over time. So a significant number of these petroglyph sites contain what we call anthropomorphs, created by Tiwa speaking people ancestral to modern day Taos and Picaris Pueblo. So the decision to depict human bodies is part of a broader set of transitions and image selection by indigenous groups who seem to move away from these kind of abstract depictions and towards more iconic images. As suggested by Severin Fowles, this turn towards representing human and animal bodies is directly associated with the adoption of village-based agriculture and marks an important shift in the representational style and logic of image depiction among indigenous people. Comparative evidence from outside the Northern Rio Grande suggests that over time, indigenous people began creating more representational images such as animal tracks, as well as disarticulated hands and feet, which have been interpreted as relating to water and fertility. So here's an example of some of these disarticulated hands shown here. So the large number of tracks and dots, which these dots are hypothesized to represent scat lines within the Rio Grande Gorge, suggests that these images may have served as a kind of representational map of tracking logics employed by indigenous hunters. The presence of these kind of naturalistic images associated with hunting and gathering activities, along with this kind of general absence of evidence for base camps, indicate that the northern extent of the Rio Grande Gorge was part of a kind of sophisticated logistical mobility pattern associated with hunting wild game on the Taos Plateau. Okay, so 
we what we start to see here, the story that we start to see here in terms of indigenous land use is that the Rio Grande Gorge played an important role in shaping how indigenous people were using the plateau. This pattern actually differs between east and west sides of the gorge. So on the west side, indigenous peoples continue to practice residential mobility. Landscape features on this side of the gorge were either associated with kind of discrete tool refurbishment areas, as we see at Cerro de la Ola, Three Basins, and Aurora Concha, or with large numbers of bifacial tools and cores like what we see at Concha Lake. So these trends indicate that the west side of the gorge was consistently used as a hunting and gathering location by indigenous communities over time. In addition to hunting and gathering, the material evidence of playa sites on the west side of the gorge point to the existence of two distinct mobility circuits that emerged during the late 15th century. One defined by individualistic and small group logistical mobility and the other characterized by this kind of large scale residential mobility. This is kind of what I call a low and high intensity pattern. So this high intensity pattern is signaled by the stone rings at Punch Lake, which are directly surrounded by a diverse and extensive assemblage of bifacial tools and ground stone materials, which indicate a kind of large scale intensive residential occupation. In contrast, Places like Arroyo Puncha and Three Basins have these kind of small clusters of only between two and five stone rings. The small size of these encampments, along with a kind of general lack of associated tools, indicates that ancestral Ute and Apache groups were using these playas as kind of short-term camping spots. So uh, it's difficult to tell seasonality of these sorts of encampments. But we can uh, get a, a potential sense of when people might have been camping when we turn to the archival record. So, for example, this report by Governor Kachupin suggests that autumn and summer would have been kind of common times for exchange between equestrian groups like Ute and Apache communities and agricultural groups like Taos and Picaris Pueblo. So, Given this kind of archival evidence, this low intensity footprint that we see at places like Arroyo Puncha and Three Basins may indicate that these places were part of kind of a stopping point during summer and fall movements into the Rio Grande to trade with Pueblo communities. In terms of the big picture here, these kind of differences in encampment logics across playa landscapes really obscure any kind of effort to impose this one size fits all mobility model onto indigenous communities. So while the ephemeral archaeological record of the Western Taos Plateau may tempt us to think about this area as kind of unsettled territory, when viewed from an indigenous lens, the lack of substantive settlements on the west side of the plateau requires us to kind of rethink our definition of occupation. Within a Western framework, right, occupation requires a substantive investment in the land that's typically measured by agriculture or proof of permanent residency in the form of architecture. Instead, what I'd like to propose is a definition of occupation measured by consistent, although not sustained, evidence of use over time. In other words, a definition of occupation based on persistence. In contrast to the west side, there's evidence on the east side of the plateau for an intensive use of the landscape by both, by primarily uh, increasingly agricultural societies. So, for example, there's evidence for continued use of uh, Ute Mountain for logistical hunting activities over time. So, as I mentioned, Ute Mountain is kind of covered by this dispersed chipstone scatter some of the diagnostic tools which were identified or shown behind me. So there's these large quantities of day site tools, uh, both formal and informal, um, which indicate a kind of shift in tool production strategies linked to the incorporation of cultivation into indigenous subsistence. 
Furthermore, we also see by Ute Mountain coarse dry laid masonry associated with incised grayware ceramics produced by Tiwa speaking or Taos or Pickery's ancestral peoples near Ute Mountain. We also see lots of Pueblo petroglyphs identified along the eastern rim of the gorge, all of which point to a more substantive investment in the construction of place by these emergent indigenous agricultural communities. So this evidence indicates that the plateau was not abandoned as indigenous groups began to experiment with cultivation and more village-based modes of living. While indigenous groups engaged in early forms of cultivation may have primarily focused their activities on the east side of the plateau, there is also evidence that Tiwa speaking people crossed the gorge to undertake logistical trips on the west side of the plateau. Chipstone, sorry, this is an example of incised grayware uh, that I was talking about that's associated with Tiwa speaking communities and which dates to the early aggregation period of Pueblo communities during the uh, 10th to, through the 12th centuries. So chipstone tools collected from Pot Creek and Sagebrush Pueblo located south of modern day Taos indicate that Newman Dome Day Site located on the west side of the gorge was the preferred raw material for stone tool production by these early Pueblo communities. The presence of day site from the west side of the plateau at these kind of early Pueblo aggregation sites indicates that Tiwa speaking communities were crossing the gorge to collect raw materials. Indeed, the ethno-historic record suggests that the coexistence of farming and logistical mobility was actually a central facet of Taos Pueblo's early formation. So origin stories shared by residents of Taos Pueblo describe the existence of a dual economy in which Athabascan speaking winter people from the north specialized in hunting, while Tiwa speaking summer people from the south focused on farming. This origin story suggests that the contemporary community of Taos Pueblo was initially formed through the aggregation of residentially mobile big game hunters with agriculturally oriented Tiwa speaking community members. This is a merger which actually entailed a kind of symbolic and physical bridging of the east and west sides of the Taos Plateau. So while there is evidence that Tiwa speaking people were using both sides of the plateau, uh, although at different intensities, there's a notable lack of direct material evidence that Apachean and Ute groups were using the east side of the plateau from the 14th century onward. To date, all we have is a single isolated metal projectile point similar to those found uh, at other Hickoria Apache encampments elsewhere in New Mexico that has, which has been documented uh, on the east side of the plateau. So these metal points are really diagnostic. They're made from barrel hoops um, using a combination of metal chisels and hammers. And they were used as a kind of short-lived alternative to stone projectile points beginning sometime in the early 1800s and then subsiding after the 1870s. So when we find metal projectile points, we get uh, like really excited because we have basically a 40 year time range when a site could have been used, which uh, for archeologists is pretty, pretty tight uh, boundary. So we, but we only have one of these that's been found on the east side of the Taos Plateau. So this absence of evidence for a kind of uh, historic or colonial period use of the east side of the plateau by uh, ancestral Ute and Apache groups is really pronounced given Spanish archival accounts like the one shown here by Don Diego de Vargas, which suggests that Ute Mountain was actually positioned at the nexus of three different territorial zones with Athabascan people residing on the east of the Rio Grande River along the San De Cristo Mountains, Ute peoples occupying the area to the north of this, and Pueblo peoples occupying the area south. So while Ute and Apache groups would have most certainly been using uh, Ute Mountain, it's named Ute Mountain, it, by the way, right? The absence of stone rings as well as diagnostic projectile points or ceramics associated with these nomadic groups, 
represents this kind of slippage between the archaeological record and what we see in the archives. So there's a lot of different reasons why this slippage might be there. One is just a simple matter of survey bias, right? There may not have been, the evidence for uh, nomadic groups simply may not have been in the survey areas identified and covered by archeologists. There's also a big issue here of preservation, right? Nomadic uh, encampments are ephemeral. They're easily eroded because they're just stones uh, placed on the ground. And so you can have sites basically be erased just through taponomic or basic erosional processes. There's also the issue of the, that nomadic structures were highly perishable. These were made from organic materials that don't always preserve in the archeological record. So much like Ute Mountain, there's also a notable lack of archeological evidence that Ute and Apache groups were using the eastern slopes of mountains like Cerro de la Ola on the west side of the gorge. Again, the material record contrasts here with archival documents from the mid 19th century, which actually note that Ute encampments were along the base of the mountain. So this kind of lapse here between the archaeological and documentary records may represent a simple lack of familiarity with the local, local topography by American officials. It could also be gaps in survey coverage or pre preservation issues like I talked about before. Regardless, the current pattern suggests that residentially mobile groups prefer to camp at playa sites on the west side of the gorge rather than along these kind of mountain slopes on either side of the Taos Plateau. All right, in conclusion, by focusing on continuity rather than change, I've tried to draw attention to how specific places remain kind of central features of cultural landscapes at the same time that mobility and subsistence patterns change. This alternative historical model really untethers socioeconomic change from harmful notions of abandonment and disappearance, which actually end up erasing important connections between indigenous people in the deep past and indigenous communities today. This approach challenges archeological modes which frame indigenous history in the American Southwest as a unidirectional progression towards immobility. Traditionally, this linear timeline is punctuated by these kind of various moments of radical change, evidence through animal and plant domestication, and the imposition of Spanish missionization in the 16th century. The linear historical approach that archeologists have so often used obscures the centrality of mobility to human lifeways across time and space. So rather than viewing mobility as a subsistence choice, which becomes untenable as societies advance through time, it may be better conceptualized as a philosophy enacted at different levels, to different degrees, and at different times. As a way of thinking and being, mobility is not something that ends, but rather continues in modified forms, connecting the indigenous past, present, and future of people in New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was absolutely fabulous and such beautiful images to uh, to look at whilst we were whilst we were listening to your words. I should uh, give a shout out to um, Sarah Murray. She's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto who did the imagery for this book cover. So uh, you guys can, um, if you like the image, that's who who made it. <laughs> it is it's a beautiful image and your your photos of the the landscape were uh stunning as well so if the audience would like to ask any questions there are a couple of ways you can do that you can pop it in the q a box or you can pop a question in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can uh, turn on your microphone and you can ask a question in that way whilst you all have a uh, think about uh what you'd like to ask i'm gonna uh, use my uh, my privilege here to uh, kick us off and get going with a bit of a question. 
So I was, I was really taken by the phrase you used, Lindsay, when you talked about the lithic carpet in oh, some yeah. of these places. So this idea that we're in this landscape that isn't occupied, that could therefore be taken by yeah. colonizers. But it's got this kind of lithic carpet that's lying over there that in your kind of evocative description formed over thousands of years. And you've talked about kind of flipping our approach to thinking about mobility that rather than seeing settlement as the thing that we're looking for if we're thinking about different forms of mobility. Yeah. I wondered whether there's a connection there between, you talked about lots of the lithics being broken from relatively mm -hmm. quick use by the sounds of it. Yeah. Our attitude to kind of like quickly discarded stone tools playing into the kind of problems of recognizing these as persistent places that were really important yeah. to these communities. It's not a perfectly formed question, Lindsay, but I'm going to throw <laughs> that at you anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, so a lot, a lot of the kind of thought behind these, behind the interpretation of these stone tools is that they're expedient, right? And so there's a sense of expediency as an indicator of a lack of investment of time in a given place, right? You just go to a place, you get a, um, a piece of uh, raw material, you nap a stone tool, and then you move on, right? And so there's this, the immediacy of creating the tool or refurbishing the tool is actually very short. But the idea of the lithic carpet is that over time, because indigenous people revisit the same places to do these similar types of expedient activities, they create this kind of accumulative record that actually has a huge geospatial dynamic. And this is one of the, reasons why it's also been difficult to interpret the landscape of the Taos Plateau, because what we see is this kind of dispersed lithic scatter that's not bound. So we can't really say, oh, this was one activity site or this was used during this particular time period. Uh, and it's hard to create site boundaries, which our archeologists love to do. We like to have our nice little boundaries, <laughs> but the record just shows this kind of continued um, distributed use of the entire space. So I think in that sense, we want to think about um, not frequency, but maybe just like the, the um, dispersion and the ways in which that dispersion demonstrates like long term use. I, I also don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, that, that absolutely did answer my question. That kind of thinking changing our thinking about it in order to recognize a very different kind of persistence in place and a different idea about mobility and you can see there the kind of the ground laid for the the problems that we see with the arrival of the of colonizers who don't see what is yeah. there in that, right. in that yeah they, of the, the i mean the the spanish have a different way of of kind of thinking about occupation than the Americans do. Um, but both, both kind of ways of the colonial state was thinking about occupation involved agriculture. That's a shared assumption that the Spanish and uh, uh, later Euro-American settlers had was that agriculture indicated occupation. And that is a sort of logic that actually was used. You can find the archival documents that show like, show European colonizers saying people aren't doing agriculture and therefore they don't occupy the land, right? So it becomes this like really pernicious way of, of, of disenfranchising people. And a complex archaeological problem for you in that sense of like, you know, I can't, I can't tell you where the edges of this site are and I can't tell you what it dates <laughs> yeah. to. It could be anywhere in this massive yeah. time range. I can't um, tell you how infuriating Yeah. Clive, go ahead. You've got a question for Lindsay. Yeah, thank you very much, Lindsay. I, I really enjoyed that. I, I, I kept thinking sometimes that I was in Australia because it's the same sort of issues. Uh, Rachel's mentioned about the carpet of lithics, yeah. and that's what Australia has. Uh, and Australia has these, well, what would now be called persistent places uh, um, without those sorts of settlements that, uh, um, again, the Western uh, farmers moving into that area just couldn't understand it and so wrote a completely different type of history. 
uh, and only now is, is it being reclaimed. The thing that comes out though, and you had a lovely quote in one of the early slides about the importance of trackways mm -hmm. and how the track is in a sense the territory. And so yes. if you shift from looking at it as a farmer where you've got a kind of classic catchment or territory around a site where you have the crops, to looking at it in terms of these trackways, which are equally territorial, but also, as you showed, bring in all the cosmological aspects, then you really do, uh, as you showed, open up a, a really very exciting new type of settlement archaeology in these, in these areas and start to deal with the whole problem of change or the question of change in very different ways. So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about those tracks and, 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 and how uh, you see them as fitting into the, the general um, picture of persistent places. It's, it's almost persistent tracks rather than yeah. persistent places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, and it's, it's rare that I would say like uh, that Deleuze and Guattari provide a kind of interesting framework for indigenous history, but this might be one of those instances where you actually, the, the kind of concept of flightways and pathways that Deleuze and Guattari talk about actually provides a way of thinking about how mobile groups were using the landscape in ways that really defy and push back against the kind of Cartesian boundaries, the plots, the grids of the Western colonial state. And so I think like, yeah, I think trails actually become a really important way of mapping networks of movement across space in the same way that we can use these kind of dispersed lithic carpets to, to document use of space on a broader geo, geographical scale. And so there's increasing kind of interest in actually documenting longstanding trails over time. For example, uh, the Santa Fe Trail is actually originally a Ute trail that was used uh, prior to Spanish colonization, but then got used by Hispano settlers and later Euro-American settlers to take, uh, to take goods across the Southwest and Great Basin into California. And so thinking about these trails and actually doing the kind of archaeological archiving to figure out how they were used over time helps us to get a better sense of these kind of broad networks. And the other big thing, right, is using the geochemical sourcing to show the networks, right? So being able to demonstrate that we, we have materials coming from primary raw material sources in the Jemez Mountains 100 kilometers away or from California or elsewhere shows these kind of networks which aren't spatialized but that we can visualize how they're moving across these big spaces. Thank you. Fantastic. So um, I have a lovely comment uh, from uh, Kate Han in the chat saying, thanks for the brilliant talk, Lindsay. Your book is going to be a classic for all archaeological <laughs> and anthropological theory. It's really exciting stuff. Um, we're a bit quiet on questions otherwise, which is unusual from a prehistoric society uh, audience that we, uh, we haven't got more questions. Um, but um you can continue to pop them in the chat i'm going to hand over to matt at this point to uh offer a vote of thanks and um take us take us forward in that way um yeah well i mean your your talk speaks for itself and the the comments and the discussion just now it, it's um really enlightening to see see you approach this this um uh, this topic in in this way and and show kind of a day, very different perspective from what certainly we're used to in Western Europe. Um, so thank you so much for kind of agreeing to give this talk and and contributing to the prehistoric society's um, global past series and kind of you've demonstrated exactly what uh, we hope to achieve with this series in providing these different perspectives and bringing new ideas that um, on you know the past in different parts of the world. Um, oh, we we have got a question just pop, popped in from uh, Linda Herkham. So I'll put my thanks on hold. Uh, 
The uh, Linda has asked in the opening section, the route through the landscape showed some stopping places that looked fairly regular, um, which was really interesting. But Linda wondered how the means of transport, horse versus on foot, um, affected the landscape exploitation. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I didn't uh, mention uh, the horse at all <laughs> in today's talk. Um, but yes, so one of the things, right, that we see over time in the archaic period, that 5,500 BC to 900 CE, is a shift in mobility from really long term residential mobility over big spaces to more localized residential mobility within smaller networks. What happens when horses become reintroduced into the northern southwest during the 16th century, late 16th century, early 17th century, is we see a reversal in that mobility circuit to then again expand out. So we see a kind of contraction of mobility, although not a stopping of mobility, and then an expansion of mobility courtesy of the horse, which made travel infinitely more efficient for indigenous communities. And so within this kind of expanding mobility network that we see uh, being made possible by the distribution of the horse across the Southwest and, and North America is Taos actually becomes a really strategic node within mobility circuits by indigenous groups like the Ute, the Apache, and the Comanche. And so we see this kind of, again, evidence of continuity where Taos Pueblo prior to Spanish colonization was a key place where nomadic traders came to bring big game resources in exchange for agricultural products. And we see a continuity of that well into the Spanish colonial period and into the American period of Taos being the central place that brings nomadic groups from hundreds of miles away on the Great Plains and the Great Basin, as well as south from Texas and Mexico City up into the northern Rio Grande. So yeah, the, the horse radically changes the type of mobility circuits that people are able to engage in. Um, in, a, in a kind of reversal of this pattern uh, towards increasingly localized mobility that we see prior to Spanish colonization. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, if there are no more questions, we will draw this draw this to a close. Um, but thank you again so much okay. for, for taking the time to come and talk to us about this fantastic topic. Um, I think we can all agree it's amazing that we can do things like this like <laughs> over from America to give us a talk on a well yeah. frankly very damp Monday evening uh, here in Edinburgh but um, I still I've still got uh, like six more hours of work to do <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, oh sorry we have another question come in if you've got time in your six more hours yeah um, <laughs> I, got, I got six more hours <laughs> Uh, so Brian Gooder has uh, asked, was there conflict between the Utes, Apache uh, and Comanche before European invasion or were they well settled? Well settled as you've shown them to be. Yeah, so it, as all good uh, academics, I will rely on the phrase, it's complicated. <laughs> um, prior, prior to what we know based on the archaeological record, prior to Spanish contact is that Athabascan groups or ancestral Apachean groups were moving into the Great Basin and Southwest around the 13th century, although that date increasingly gets pushed back. And so there was already Ute, ancestral Ute groups in the Great Basin at that, moving into the area around that same time. And so there is territorial conflict between what we call Athabascan speaking groups those who are ancestral to Apache and Navajo communities, and new mixed speaking groups, those who are ancestral to Ute peoples in the Great Basin. So we do see conflict as these two communities are actually forming and um, settling this Great Basin area. We also, during the Spanish colonial period, see heightened conflict between one uh, new mixed speaking group, the Comanche, 
and Apachean groups who had settled on the plains to the east of New Mexico. So Comanche groups moved out of the Great Basin into the plains in response to a, a boom in the bison population during the 14th century. And so that movement onto the plains again came into conflict with Apachean groups who were already living on the plains who had come to live there about 100 years prior. And so again, we see this conflict between nomadic groups over territorial resources linked to big game hunting uh, and, and um, procurement areas within the plains and the Great Basin. So these are neighboring regions to northern New Mexico that actually have an influence on New Mexican demography because these conflicts that we see during the during prior to Spanish colonization and during colonization actually draw people into the Taos Valley who are being pushed out by the conflicts. So we see Apache groups during Spanish colonization come into New Mexico, come into the Rio Grande in response to Comanche aggressions on the plain. And prior to Spanish colonization, we see Apache groups moving into New Mexico in response to uh, conflicts with Ute groups living in the Great Basin. So yeah, it, it has an impact on the demography of, of the Taos Valley. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, right, before I begin again, any other <laughs> questions? Uh, I, I think we'll say, I think we'll say we're done on questions. All um, right, so <laughs> thank you, thank you so much again um, for coming and speaking to us. Um, and it just um, remains for me to give a plug for our next lecture, which will be uh, on the seventh of March. Uh, on early China and prehistoric silk routes uh, by Professor Li Zhang. So um, a completely different topic again, as every topic in Global Past is different. Um, so I hope that you'll all join us on 7th of March and we'll be putting out announcements on social media and via our membership. Great. Now, Thanks. Thank you all. Bye, have you. a good day, Lindsay. Thank you. <laughs> and have a good night, everyone on this side of the Atlantic. Thank <laughs> you.